Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome to Super Breakfast Friends Club. This show that we've welcomed you to most weeks for a long time now. Ew, we're coming up on two years. Yeah, two years in February. That's disgusting. How you doing, Mel? Mm, well, it's cold. It's cold and I don't like it. Yeah, I spend most of my days cold and angry about it. This week, we have a super low quality episode for you, which I know I know, Mel is, is your favorite thing. Absolutely. You, you love it when the only <laughs> videos I can find of something are old VHS recordings that you can barely hear. Yeah, I turned it on and I was so excited. It's like I found a dusty old VHS in my parents' house and popped it in. It does mean, though, that when I play the theme song for you here, and any clips that I play are going to have a buzzing in them. I will do my best to clean <laughs> it up, but uh, please don't ask too much of me. <laughs> it's gonna sound real, real good in your headphones. Here comes the theme song. Sorry. These people want to know. And one of these people could find her. Jerry Lynn Huckabee. Prashant Rao. Mike Turner. The gun shoe who captures Tom in San Diego will win a fabulous vacation. And this is the man who will lead the investigation. Greg Lee. <laughs> it's Carmen San Diego again. We came back. I freaking love the Carmen San Diego theme song. It's a bop. It's real good. It has been stuck in my head off and on for like a week. <laughs> yeah. That and the zombie jamboree, but we'll we'll get to the zombie. Oh yeah, jamboree. yeah. We, will. <laughs> we are watching. An episode of Where in the World is Carmen San Diego titled The Purloined Pooch. Oh, yeah. Which originally aired December 18th, 1991. So we're watching it pretty close to an anniversary of its airing. That would make it, what, 33? 32? 33? 30, 32, I think. Yeah. Right? I don't know. Don't ask me to count. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. old. It's old. This was the 58th episode of the first season of Carmen San Diego, but apparently it was the first one they recorded. Oh, so that's why we're watching it? Yeah, that's why I thought this was interesting to look at. And I did notice there were a decent number of rule changes from in, in between this one being filmed and the first one we watched being filmed. They changed up the rules quite a lot. I don't remember the first episode we watched, so you'll have to point it out when we get there. I will do, don't you worry. I didn't remember either. I went back and looked at the one we watched again to like compare the rules for each round. Mm -hmm. And every round has some kind of rule change. Okay. None of them are exactly as they were. So obviously, when they recorded this one, you can, you can kind of see where they decided that the game wasn't quite working out. <laughs> <laughs> in between this episode and the first one that aired you know if this was a this was a pilot episode basically and uh interesting that they still aired it even if they did wait until 58 episodes in <laughs> that does explain a lot because the thing that i noticed most was something of a tone change i feel like they really found their stride in the later episodes and it got a little For bit sure. more fun they're a little bit more awkward in this one yeah. than they were in the other one we watched, for sure. If I didn't go into this knowing that they filmed this one first, I would be like, what happened? Yeah, I thought maybe <laughs> they were getting burnt out or something. It's like, it's only the second episode. What's happening? Yeah, no, don't worry. It's, uh, they were just finding their stride. Well, good. So we're introduced to our three contestants. Jerry Lynn Huckabee. Prashant Rao, and Mike Towner. All right, who did you put your money on? Which child are you betting on? Oh, you know, I didn't make a choice this early on, 
I, I feel like it would be unfair to make a choice now since I already know who won. But if I'm putting my if I'm putting my past hat on and I'm thinking back to when I first saw this opening, I think I would put my money on Prashant immediately. Yes, yes, that's who I was thinking. Okay. We won't spoil who makes it to the end. <laughs> but You uh, have to listen to us jabber on first. <laughs> yeah. If you want to to play along at home, watch the episode first. Uh, it's available on YouTube, The Purloined Pooch. And uh, you note down all of the guesses you made, and then we'll compare them at the end. And, to, and let us know if you beat us. <laughs> let us at know in the comments. Children's geography game. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in some of these questions, these kids beat me. Really? Yeah, not you. <laughs> no, this episode felt a lot easier. Oh, okay. Well, let's see. So Greg Lee is here as the host again, as last time. And we've, of course, still got um, the chief I making the her chief. return. She's so I good. like the chief. Yeah, she's really good. I love her frequent use of alliteration. Mm -hmm. I just love her delivery. Everything is so serious and dire. Yeah, for sure. I don't know if... There was an analog of the chief in Netflix's Carmen Sandiego prequel, but I hope so. I didn't watch too much of it. I think I watched the whole first season. I should watch the rest because I was enjoying it. Eventually, we'll cover it on this show. Oh yeah, I guess I guess that is a thing we do here. <laughs> it sure is. I don't know why, but the cartoon is divorced in my brain. It's like that's not from Carmen Sandiego. That's a completely different IP called Carmen Sandiego. <laughs> Well, we, here's the thing, right? We've got two different game shows because there's this one and there's Where in Time is Carmen San Diego. Mm -hmm. And we've also got two different cartoon series because they had a 90s one too. That's a lot of Carmen. Yeah, there's plenty of Carmen San Diego to go around. Take that as you wish. Our criminal this time is Patty Larceny, which is a great name. <laughs> as a longtime Phoenix Wright fan. <laughs> the use of <laughs> bad puns is exquisite. Yeah, I I like Patsy Larsony way more than the criminal last time, which was Vic the Slick. Yeah, he sucked. It was a nice rhyme, but it's not a pun, and I want all of the names to be puns. Yeah. Patty Larsony, perfect. How else are we supposed to know that these people are criminals if their names don't tell us outright? Exactly. <laughs> So apparently she has committed a crime in Nairobi, Kenya at the East Africa Kennel Club Dog Show. She has dognapped a Lhasa Apso, known as Apso Sinkai of Rough Rough. All right. I think that's what the chief said. <laughs> a Lhasa Apso, known as Apso Sinkai of Rough Rough. I, I, I don't even know. I was so confused by what she said that I kind of blacked out for a second. I was very taken aback and lost for a moment, but it just kind of breezes by. She talks so quickly, and it never comes up again what the dog's <laughs> name is, so... <laughs> I was mostly just enamored by the fact that they used a Lhasa Apso instead of, like, a Shih Tzu or something. Nobody ever talks about Lhasas. Was it... I'm trying to remember what Vic the Slick stole. Was it the Mona Lisa? Yeah. Right, okay. So I was... I was surprised that after this priceless piece of famous art was stolen in the last one we watched apparently the thing that was stolen in the first episode was a dog um not just a dog but a wonderful beautiful breed of dog well yeah and apparently it was a prize winner at a dog show but still that seems like something that would be harder to fence you know Actually, no, I don't know. I feel like it would be a lot easier to fence a prize-winning dog. Well, there's so much upkeep involved. Sure, but everybody's looking for the Mona Lisa. You can't just sell that on eBay. <laughs> I guess I guess you could... Oh, I don't know. Maybe you could hide a dog in plain sight more easily than the Mona Lisa, I guess. Uh, Yeah, everybody knows what the Mona Lisa is, but how many people know about... Which dogs won the 
East African prize for best dog or whatever. <laughs> In Nairobi, Kenya. Right. Yeah, all right. Yeah, okay. You got me. <laughs> you win. <laughs> so, uh, Lhasa Apso, do you know, did you know about Lhasa Apsos before this? I've had two Lhasa Apsos. Is that what your dogs were? Uh-huh. I didn't realize. And I don't think it's a hot take to say that my dog was the best dog in the world. No, I don't think that's a hot take either. I know how much you loved that dog. <laughs> Some other people might think that their dogs are the best in the world, but it's simply not true. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I actually, you know, I, I don't tend to think too much about dog breeds. I just like most dogs I've known. I'm just kind of like most dogs in my family are unidentifiable as just any breed. <laughs> yeah. So like usually any dogs that members of my family have had, it's like, well, we think he's part this. Right. But <laughs> but nobody knows. Uh, for people who don't know, for people who aren't experts like Mel here, <laughs> the Lhasa Apso is a Tibetan dog breed that was bred as a watchdog for indoors because it was noisy. <laughs> my aunt had a Lhasa Apso that barked constantly but my dog was a good dog yeah i don't remember ever hearing too much from your dog she would bark at like people ringing the doorbell yeah that's but normal though my aunt's dog would bark at people ringing the doorbell and then if it was family coming inside she would bark at the family that was inside and <laughs> <laughs> just keep on barking for a while yeah i do i remember hearing more from you when your dog was around than from your dog <laughs> she was a very quiet and good girl. She was a very good girl. Most people know Lhasa Apsos as being the um, mop-looking dogs. Because yeah. show Lhasas have long, long hair. Right. Because so, Rosie didn't, right? No, that's way too much upkeep. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Maybe that's why I didn't realize that's what she was. Probably. <laughs> I feel like the common Lhasa owner is just like, no, nah, fuck that. Shave the dog. Yeah. We get a little fact card about Patty, a.k.a. the teacher's pet. Cute as a button, sweet as a kitten, sneaky as a weasel. Weird, but all right. <laughs> yeah, who's writing these? <laughs> Someone with a crush on Patty Larceny. <laughs> she stole their heart. And then a dog. <laughs> That's how she got the dog. <laughs> So each of the three gumshoes, that's what they call the contestants, <laughs> is given 125 crime bucks and told that it costs 10 crime bucks to fly somewhere, but if they go to the wrong place, it'll cost them an additional five, which seemed needlessly confusing to me. Yeah. By the time they filmed the other episode we've looked at, that had been simplified. So in the other one we watched, they start with 50 crime bucks and they just get 10 for each correct answer. And there's none of this spending money to go places and spending extra to go to the wrong place. Yeah, that, that feels a lot better. Yeah. You can tell, like, even at this point, you can tell that Greg at least thought that this was overcomplicated because he... As he's explaining it to the kids, he kind of, like, laughs at the silliness of it. Got it? Got it! Okay. He's just here to do a job. He's just here to be a good host. Yeah. He's... I think... I think that he was struggling to understand the rules. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the one explaining them, so... <laughs> Passing those rules on to a group of children, probably a bit confusing. <laughs> yeah. The chief gives them... A clue on where they should be headed. She says, fly to one of the world's highest airports in the home of the Lhasa Apso breed. P.S. The region is now under Chinese control. And then Greg says he thought it was part of China. And the chief says, if you ask the Chinese, they'll say it's part of China. But if you ask the Dalai Lama, he'll say it's not. That's a lot of clues. It's a lot of clues. <laughs> and uh, the choices given... For the, for the kids are Taiwan, Thailand, and Tibet. I thought this one was pretty easy. Yeah, me too. Yeah, it's Tibet. I got Tibet. Prashant and Mike both got it right. Not me, Mike. Mike Towner. But also you, Mike. But also me, Mike, yeah. This is one of the rare occasions you're not speaking in the third person. <laughs> but Jerry Lynn got it wrong. 
What a so fool. she loses an extra five points. Now she just has to go hang out in Taiwan for a while. Is that where she went? I think so. I think you're right, yeah. <laughs> and now a talking yak appears. <laughs> and he talks for a while. Yeah. I I struggle with some of these clues because the characters go on for so long. Or they have ridiculous voices. Yes, I absolutely... Like, he got to the end of his spiel and then they start giving options and I was like, wait, what? I'm... I'm so glad that Greg repeats the clues yeah. divorced from the character. That was a problem I had in the last episode we watched, too. Yeah. So, uh, luckily, I don't know what the yak was talking about, but luckily, <laughs> Greg tells us that the clues were the Brahmaputra River, the Bay of Bengal, and that it was formerly East Pakistan. So the options are Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan. Did you get this one right? I did, and now I don't remember which one I picked. The only reason I got it right is because they showed a map and, like, highlighted the areas they were talking about. I was like, it's probably that one. But that's the reason I got it wrong. Really? Yes, because they show the map and they highlight these three places. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, well, that's India in the middle. So if it's called... And I know that Pakistan is to the west of India. So if it was formerly called East Pakistan, it's got to be to the west of India. So I picked Afghanistan because that was the only one that was to the west of India. But apparently it was the one on the east of India. <laughs> and I figured it couldn't be that one because it's on the other side of India from Pakistan. But apparently I looked this up. Apparently that's where East Pakistan was. That's wild. So Pakistan and East Pakistan were separated by India. Which is not a small country. <laughs> no, it's not. It's very large. <laughs> That's wild to me. But hey, I learned something. I'm just going to forget it in about 20 minutes like I did the first time. <laughs> I'll remind you someday. So, <laughs> hey, you remember that time we watched Carmen San Diego <laughs> and we learned that East Pakistan was separated by the entire country of India? And I'll be like, no, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> shut up. I'm trying to play Borderlands. <laughs> Trying to play Left 4 Dead, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Left 4 Dead 2 in the year 2034. Oh, we'll still be playing Left 4 Dead 2 in the year 2034. Absolutely. That was a joke because it's true. Yeah. <laughs> so all of the kids got this right and I got it wrong. All three of them got this right. Yeah. This begins the trend of everybody getting everything right. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we really see many wrong answers for the rest of the episode, actually. I don't think we do, no. Because the whole time, I'm, I'm rooting for Jerry Lynn because she's five points behind. And I'm like, how do, how do you get ahead? Except for they just have to get something wrong. Yeah. So this is where a fish comes flying through the window. Yeah. Apparently thrown by this girl whose name I think was Newton? No comment. <laughs> <laughs> I just, anyway. I loved, I loved her. I loved the fish. I loved the whole spiel. Yeah, she was good. I hope that she's recurring. I don't know if she is. Mm -hmm. I know there are some like recurring clue givers that show up, but I think she might only be in this one. Is there a, where in the world is Carmen San Diego wiki for us to yeah, check? Yeah, but there doesn't seem to be a page for her. Boo. I mean, they didn't even have a page for our man Fuzzy Slippers, so can we trust wiki writers? <laughs> we can never trust wiki writers. I have never trusted wiki writers. <laughs> That's why you go to them and read the most egregious cases of bad information to me. I love them. I love wikis. <laughs> so good. So Newton comes in. Apparently this fish that she threw in was a clue. So she gives a bunch of facts about about the next place, I guess, and its relation to fish. Mm-hmm. How they eat a lot of it. Yeah, they eat a lot of herring and salmon, specifically. Uh, she also mentions Helsinki and that it's above the Arctic Circle. At this point, Greg interrupts after the clue giving to ask all the kids if they play sports. <laughs> who, who cares? Hey, I care, because part of the problem I had with this episode is that we don't see a lot of the kids themselves. I feel like the first episode we watched, we really, we got a lot of back and forth with the kids. We got to learn a little bit about them. 
It just it kind of humanized the contestants in a fun way, you know. I suppose. I think my problem was that they should have had this conversation before the fish came through the window. Oh, for sure, for sure. The timing wasn't great <laughs> because we've just been given a clue, and these kids are about to make a choice, and then he's just like, "All oh, right, well, that was a great clue we got. Do you guys play sports?" <laughs> <laughs> They're clutching their little answers, just waiting to drop them. <laughs> yeah, and you can kind of see that they're taken aback by it as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't really... The only one who gives, like, an impassioned answer is Jerry Lynn. because She's a cheerleader. She's so excited about it. But the others are just like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I play sports. <laughs> yeah, I guess I do baseball and whatever. <laughs> when do we answer the question? <laughs> And and she, I think she only gave uh, uh, an answer that seemed prepared because she was the last one to be asked. Yeah, that's fair. So anyway, our options are Ireland, Finland, and Denmark. I chose Finland because it's the only one above the Arctic Circle. Mm-hmm. And, th- and that was right. And all the kids got that right as well. <laughs> Yay. And this is the part where Greg gets called into the chief's office. This happens around this point in every episode. It just lets us know what's at stake. Yeah, just to reiterate what the prize is, basically. We we are told at the beginning of the episode that the contestants can win a, a vacation somewhere in, in the US, but uh the lower forty eight states. In the in the lower forty eight states, yeah. I remember because I think the first episode of this we watched was the first time I'd ever heard the phrase lower forty eight states. <laughs> the lesser forty eight. Yeah, doesn't it mean, doesn't it basically mean anywhere but Alaska and Hawaii? Is That's that right? That's exactly what it means. Yeah, okay. You know, the state everybody would go to if they had the choice? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I hear Alaska's nice, but too cold for me. They get a ransom note from Patty asking for Lyra, uh, mentioning the Via della Scrofa, and mentioning Fettuccini. This could be anywhere. Apparently, this is the only episode that uses a ransom note here. Every other episode uses a tapped phone line, and we listen in on a phone call from the villain instead. That's a weird change. Yeah. I think it might have just been a way to incorporate more animation. (laughs) More of that dynamite animation. Yeah, that animation made by, what was it, like 15 people working overnight on Max or something? (laughs) I mean... It's a tiny team, and didn't they win awards for it or something? They did. I think they did. You're right. I I'd love that for that, them, but... but like looking back at it, it's so hard to stomach. <laughs> but it's it's cute. This this MS Paint animation. <laughs> it is. It is. It's excruciatingly '90s, and I love it. I'm assuming this being the first episode. I'm assuming that not very much of the animation was done yet. I'm assuming they were still working on it while this was being filmed. Yeah. So that's probably why we see more animation in the uh, in the other one we watched. But uh, anyway, the options here are Athens, Tunis, or Rome. It's very obviously Rome. Yeah. All the kids got it right. Where else are you going to get fettuccine? Um, at this point in the world, uh, literally anywhere. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> But apparently Patsy escaped before they got there. What a slippery weasel. But luckily, a giant talking fly <laughs> shows up to tell us what happened. You mean Uncle, what was his name? Uncle Harry? Uncle Frank? One of those. <laughs> Uncle Harry? <laughs> I forgot about him. No, the whole time it was giving me flashbacks of that terrible man fly. Mel is referring to Uncle Harry from the Maniac Mansion show, which we have covered, what, twice now? Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, we gotta go back. I don't want to, but I do. We gotta watch a Eugene Levy episode. That's true. (laughs) At least. The last one we watched, a man fly cheated on his wife with a real fly. (laughs) (laughs) And the whole thing, like... The whole show so far has just been in like one set. Yeah. Anyway, we're not talking about we're not talking <laughs> about Maniac Mansion. We've got plenty to say about Maniac Mansion on a Maniac Mansion episode. Anyway, the fly I didn't take in a word the fly said. I was just too taken aback by this fly. It's buzzing around, the camera's following it as it buzzes around and talks. It's kind of a sensory assault. 
Yes, it sure is. But Greg tells us the relevant clues, which are that it's in New England, that it's got wake Lake Winnie Pesuk Do you know how to pronounce that? Um, type it. No. <laughs> it's like it's Winnie something. I can't remember. It's really long. Winnie Pesuki. Winnie Pesuki. Winnie Pesuki. Uh, and the uh, capital is Concord. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the options here are Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, or Vermont. I picked New Hampshire, I think, on a whim. Because I don't know too much about the New England area. Yeah. But I figured New Hampshire and Vermont were the two that looked like they would be in the area that I know is called New England. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm assuming you got it right. You've yeah. You've got the, the home advantage here. I do, but also I hate state capitals. So anytime it's like, anytime anybody asks me what the capital of something is or tries to get me to identify a state just by saying it's capital, I'm like, I don't know. That information isn't relevant to me as an adult in 2023. No. You, well, but Mel, you're not going to just have an encyclopedia in your pocket to look it up whenever you want. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, they're right. Oh, <laughs> I'm just dumb all the time. Uh, that's what they always told us. You're not just gonna be able to look this stuff up when you're when you're on the train. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> that's the world we live in now. <laughs> all right, third grade teacher, give me one real world example where I'm going to need to know the state capital of every state. <laughs> Uh, hey, you know who shows up here? Um, your boyfriend? My boyfriend. <laughs> your celebrity crush? Pendulet, you mean? The very same? I don't think I know Teller's last name. Or is Teller his last name? I would guess Teller is his last name. What's his first name? Pendulet. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so weird. First of all, Pendulet is not my celebrity crush. <laughs> but for the past week, he's just been all over my life. <laughs> he's haunting you. He has a parasocial relationship with you. <laughs> <laughs> because I was watching the Mystery Science Theater 3000 Turkey Day Marathon. I was sick over Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving. And um, so I was watching the Turkey Day Marathon because it happened to be on. And because I love Mystery Science Theater. and. Some of the, in, in between the episodes, and sometimes, you know, at the ad breaks in the episodes, they're advertising for their fundraiser f to make a new season. And one of the bumpers that they used is narrated by Penn Jillette. Apparently because he used to do a lot of the bumper narration when the show was on Comedy Central, back in the Comedy Central days. So they brought him back in to record a new ad for them now. And I'm listening to it and I'm like, who is that? I know that <laughs> voice. Who is that? <laughs> and it took me ages to figure out. I had to open up the stream chat. I always close the stream chat on things like that where there's not actually a, a chatting streamer. Like if I'm watching um, Mystery Science Theater or like a Nintendo Direct or something, I don't want to see the stream chat because it's just people being annoying. <laughs> you just got to find the right crowd. But anyway. Well, yeah. But I, uh, yeah, I guess the the gore crowd were good. Yeah. <laughs> like, really neat. Like, Nintendo Direct, absolutely not. That's full of insufferable people. But if you're yeah. in, like, a really niche stream, there's some fun to be had. Now that you mention it, I should have left it open for Mystery Science Theater because all of the, all of the times that I've had the stream chat open during Mystery Science Theater stuff, it's been fine. The The people watching Mystery Science Theater on Twitch are oh, great. So I'm sorry that I had your stream chat closed, everybody out there, if you're listening. Because <laughs> those people are just going to be the super fans, and some of them have fun information that maybe you didn't know. That's true, and this is a good case of that, because I opened up the stream chat and I asked them who that voice was, because I was trying to place it, and they told me. So thanks, Mystery Science Theater 3000 stream chatters. <laughs> um, quick aside... Yeah. Teller was born Raymond Joseph Teller, but has since legally changed his name to the mononym Teller. Just Teller? Just Teller. You can do that? 
I guess so. What happens if an official government form asks you for first and last name? You just put none. Because, I mean, forms can ask you for a middle name. You're not legally required to have one of those. <laughs> I guess if you put none, aren't they going to be like, ah, oh, yes, tell a none. I don't know. Put a... Just scribble through it. <laughs> I guess. I mean, I guess Teller would be his first name. I don't know. I'm Yeah, I, that's what I'm wondering. Like, is it his first name or his last name? Yes. <laughs> it's Teller Teller. <laughs> anyway, that was the first time they showed up. <laughs> And then me and Mel, Mel has just bought a new computer, which can run Borderlands 3. So we are playing through it together. And then Penn and Teller showed up in there. <laughs> and now they're here. <laughs> now they're here. He's, he's coming for you. He's for you specifically. For you know, I can't... I, I do like Penn, Penn and Teller. I used to watch a lot of Fool Us and bullshit back when I was in college. And um, it's good. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I haven't seen them in a long time. I assume they still work. Well, this is them making up for that lost time. <laughs> anyway, they tell a, a long story about bats. Was he doing like a card trick while he was telling the story? I wasn't paying attention. Yes and no. Like he was messing with a deck of cards, but I don't think he did anything really... Fancy. I think he kind of flicked a few of them out. Okay. Yeah, he, he tells this story. It's like a special report. It doesn't seem to be connected to what's going on at all. He, Penn just wants to tell a story about bats. Bats coming from underground in New Mexico <laughs> and the Guadalupe Mountains. Anyway, we're given three <laughs> options. Yeah, suddenly we're told that this was, in fact, a clue. Yeah, I didn't, I really didn't, I was just kind of like, okay, bats, and then three options came up, and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I was just so taken aback by the fact that your boyfriend showed up here of all places. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty shocked, too. <laughs> well, you spoiled me on it, because you watched it before I did. I thought you had already watched it, so no, I had a I good laugh. Usually I've already watched it when you do, but <laughs> this time I hadn't. Because I didn't want to watch it before I was ready to take notes because I didn't want to... I wanted to be able to write down what I was choosing for each answer. Right. Because usually I'll watch it once and then I'll watch it again and, and take notes. Anyway, the options here were Carlsbad Caverns, Big Bend, and Arches. I picked Carlsbad Caverns. I did too. Do you want to know why I knew this one? Yes. Because it's in the Goofy movie. Oh, my <laughs> lord. <laughs> Why else am I supposed to know about Carl's Bad Caverns? <gasps> That's a good point. I had never heard of Carl's Bad Caverns before. <laughs> oh, were you just making a guess? I sure was. An oh, educated okay. one. Well, mine was educated because there, there's a like road trip montage in the Goofy movie. And one of the things in the montage is Goofy and Max taking a photo outside Carl's Bad Caverns. And the flash goes off and then like a hundred bats fly out and <laughs> they have to run away from him. I spent this entire episode waiting for Greg to summarize the clues and then making a panic decision. Yeah, basically. <laughs> but all the kids got this one right too. Mm-hmm. And then Greg tells them that now they can choose to bet 0, 5, 10, 15, or 20 crime bucks on their next answer. Yeah, they don't even let them bet their whole pool. No, in later episodes, they can risk anything from 0 to 50. Okay, that's better. Yeah, that's how it was in the last one we watched. Also, the last one had a lightning round. We didn't get a lightning round. Was that because they were tied or something? I think they just hadn't added one yet. Oh, yeah. So this one confused me because we're given the options before we're given the clue this time. The options are Atlanta, Georgia, Mobile, Alabama, or Charleston, South Carolina. Okay, so I was very confused at this part too. I was like, did I just space out and miss the entire clue or something? No, we haven't been given the clue yet. At this point, we're told those three options and then the kids are told to decide what they're going to bet. They're not deciding an answer yet. Oh, yeah. They're just he's... deciding 
how he much he tells them bet. if you're familiar with this area of the world you might want to bet more and if you're not yeah. then don't yeah yeah so rockapella sing a little thinking song which i thought was funny Okay. None of the kids looked like they were thinking to me. They all just looked like they were confused about the song. <laughs> or they're like, what do you mean? This is in America. I think I got it. <laughs> and then there's a knock at the door and it's Rockapella. Oh no, it's them. And they're singing a song about Patsy and how pretty she is and how many dog turds she left behind her. Walking down the road, pretty Patty. Where Sherman's army road, pretty Patty. She's left a trail that's long and true. Just look at all that doggy do. They pretty Patty. Yeah, rock a pole, ladies and gentlemen. Come on, let's hear And that's the clue. I hope you were listening. And Greg dances for a while. Yeah, the clue is in the song. I completely missed it. I Because they did this in the last episode, and I couldn't make heads nor tails of it in the last one. So I was really trying to listen, but I still missed most of it. The thing is, I didn't like tune into the song until the second half of it, and all the clues are in the first verse. Yep. And then the second half of it, they just sing about how sexy Patsy is. <laughs> And how many dog turds she left behind her. <laughs> she herself, not the dog she was carrying. Yeah, well, they don't specify. <laughs> Greg does a funky, funky dance. I enjoyed it. And, uh, <laughs> and then he comes back in. And luckily, he repeats the clues that we apparently heard. <laughs> yeah, when she said the peach state, I was like, oh, I got this one. Yeah, me too. Yeah, he says... It's nicknamed the Peach State. The capital burned during the Civil War. I didn't hear any of that in the song. Even when I re-listened, I didn't really hear the Peach State. I think they mentioned a peach at one point, but I would not have connected that to it being called the Peach State. No, me neither. So I guess, Georgia, um, I'm assuming you just knew this from being an American citizen. I did. I guessed it based on the fact that every time a movie is filmed in Georgia, the logo in the credits is a peach. <laughs> <laughs> that was my educated guess. I mean, it worked. Yeah, it did. Jerry Lynn risks five points and gets it right, which seems like a really bad strategy. She's in last place. The other two yeah. are tied. She's already trailing by five points, which means that if she gets this right, she will only be tying with the other two. Which means for her to go on to the next round, they would both have to bet more than that and be wrong. Mm-hmm. It didn't pay off for her. It did not, because Prashant bets 15 and gets it right. And then Mike also bets 15 and gets it right. So they both are tied <laughs> with 15 points more than her. <laughs> cowards. All of them cowards. Spend all your money. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's what I would have done. If I was in Jerry Lynn's position, I would have bet 20. Yeah, dump it all. Yeah, because either way, like, either you get into the lead with that or you're going home. I guess if she lost it all, she would have been humiliated with, like, $5 left. But, like, whatever. Whatever. You were on TV. You go home with that with that Carmen San Diego travel kit. Right. You got those Carmen bucks. You got, you got a, you got a t-shirt you got a wristwatch all your friends are gonna think that it's cool and you're definitely not a nerd i want the watch like now i want the watch today yeah i wonder if those sell for anything jerry lynn if you're out there and you don't want your common san diego watch anymore and you still have it <laughs> i was gonna say do you think she would hold on to that after all these years maybe maybe it's in like a drawer somewhere she's a grandmother now <laughs> a drawer at her parents house 
<laughs> the chief gives us a slideshow briefing about Atlanta. We get to see the botanical gardens and the Fox Theater and the History Center. This isn't really relevant to what's happening in the next part of the show, but we get to see it. It's a little bit relevant, but not extremely relevant. Tangentially. Now we're at the travel board. Well, it's, it, they have to include it so that it's educational, right? Because there is <laughs> nothing educational about this round. It doesn't test their knowledge in any way, and it doesn't teach anything. <laughs> it's a memory game. It's a memory game. That's all it is. So they got to include this little slideshow so that there's still some education going on because it's on PBS. <laughs> but yeah, it's time for the travel board round. This is the round where they have to connect the crook, the loot, and the warren in a, and the warrant in a single turn. In the other episode we watched, there was also a requirement to connect them in the correct order. Okay. And I remember at the time... I thought that was silly. I thought the extra requirement that they have to be connected in the right order was just overcomplicating it and was silly. But, I agree. Oh. But seeing how quickly they blow through this, I do see why they added that requirement. I don't, because it's not going to change the speed at which they blow through it. They just have to blow through it in the right order. I think it did change the speed, because the thing is... Well, I don't know. The, th the thing is, if you don't have to do it in the right order, you can be more willy-nilly about it, you know? Um, no. Because if you, if you have to do it in the right order, you might find t two of them on the same turn, but get them in the wrong order, so then you have to do it again anyway. Oh, you might forget the order that they were in and screw up that way, which I think we saw happen before. It just doesn't seem like it's going to add a substantial amount of time for a memory game. Well, I th they might have done some other stuff to make it longer, but this round definitely lasted longer the last time we watched it. But I think that was because they had trouble finding the clues. Like, they found them really quickly in this one. That's true, yeah. Prashant immediately found the warrant at City Hall on his first turn. And then Mike immediately found Patty at the Fox Theatre on his first turn. Exactly. I think there's only one turn where nobody found anything. <laughs> Prashant struck out on his second turn. That was it. Mm -hmm. And then Mike immediately found the dog on his second turn and won the round. It was just over so fast. I think they had... I think Prashant had two turns and Mike had three and it was done. No, no, wait. No, they both just had two turns. Yeah, they just had two turns each and it was over. Yeah, it was, it was pretty quick. So goodbye, Prashant. Oh, I lost the bet. Me too. I would have picked him to win. Yeah. But uh, obviously, I mean, it was luck. Absolutely. It was, it was straight up luck that Mike won there. What we learned from the first round is that when it comes to world knowledge, Prashant and Mike seem to be tied. Neither of them got a single one wrong at mm -hmm. any point. So I'm not convinced that Mike is that intelligent yet. <laughs> That is an interesting point, though, because the first part of the show absolutely requires knowledge, but then it's completely up to luck who goes on to the final round. I know. Every single time. Prashant goes home with a pocket translator. Personally, I think that's a worse prize than what Jerry Lynn got. Agreed. Maybe I would have been more impressed with it in the 90s, but now I see pocket translator, I'm like, pocket translator in 1991? That thing's not going to be any good. Right. <laughs> Pocket translators aren't any good now. <laughs> and it's all just European languages. What if I want to translate my animes? I know. <laughs> so Mike has caught Patty, but he still has to try to catch Carmen. And, oh boy. <laughs> the chief lists off the possible places Carmen might be. Alaska. Idaho. Utah. Oklahoma. Texas, Minnesota, Missouri, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania. It's half of the country. And now they take Mike to the map, a giant map of the United States. In the first episode we watched, it was a map of Africa. Yeah. Because that's where that one took place. And Mike has to track Carmen through seven states in 45 seconds. So I'm hoping that you immediately noticed the problem with this round. 
Not only does he have to find all of the right states, but he also has to match it to its correct flag. That's where the problem comes in. Yeah, absolutely. Because nobody nobody knows the state flag. You might know your own state flag, but nobody knows everybody else's state flag. So what happens is Mike has to sit there and listen to Greg give like three fun facts about the state before telling him the name of the state. And this is taking place in 45 seconds. So half of the round, it's just him waiting to be told what state he's even looking for. He knows where they all are. (laughs) (laughs) So this is the thing that was wild to me. Yeah, in the other episode we watched, the flag requirement had been dropped. And instead, they were just using generic markers with lights on them. For me personally, I would never, I wouldn't have got even one right in this round. (laughs) I know where a lot of the states are. I do not know what their flags are. That's why you... It sucked that you have to sit there and listen to him go on before actually telling you what the state is. But, right, the thing is, Mike didn't get one wrong. He got every single one right on the first try. And yet, they still have to go to a judgment call as to whether he did it in time. Yeah, because he had to sit there and listen! (laughs) Yeah! It was infuriating! (laughs) Yeah. Because he puts the last one down, he gets it right, he got every single one of them right, and they tell him, if he gets one wrong, he's got two chances to get one wrong. But when would he have those two chances to get one wrong? (laughs) Because he puts that last one down right as the buzzer goes, and Greg has to, like, call out to the judges and be like, did that count? Did he get that? And they give it to him. Yeah. But he didn't get any wrong. The time was just ridiculous. It was ridiculous. And I don't think they changed that time limit later. They just removed the uh, requirement to match it to the flags. But maybe Greg doesn't read all the state facts in the other one. I I didn't actually listen for that. Yeah, like, if they did that, that's all you need for it to be a viable game. Yeah, just say the name. Just say the name. I think think in the other one he did just say the name. I don't think he gave any facts. So this is where we learn what Mike chose as his prize, which state he wants to go to. Drum roll. It's Florida. Florida. That's probably, if my choices are the lower 48 states, that's probably what I would have chosen as a kid in 1991. Yeah, that's a pretty good option. Yeah, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah, maybe maybe San Francisco, maybe Seattle. I know these aren't states. <laughs> I'm going somewhere warm and beachy. Yeah. Since they won't let me go to Hawaii. (laughs) I know. Yeah, if Hawaii was an option, that's absolutely where I'd go. (laughs) But the, uh... Oh, what are they called? What's the name of the organization? Mm... (laughs) I don't remember. I didn't write it down. I'm blanking on it. But they're cheap anyway. (laughs) Yeah, she has a whole thing in the middle going over the name of the organization and, like, their motto and everything. Is it just the Acme Detective Agency? Oh, maybe it is. Yeah, it is. It's the Acme Detective Agency. And they said Acme so many times in that episode. I have such a big, good brain. But I hear Acme. I don't think Acme Detective Agency. I think You think Wile E. Coyote. Exactly. I think Looney Tunes. (laughs) You think That's of a rocket backfiring into your face. <laughs> Do you think it's the same company? I hope so. <laughs> their products are just like what they do. It's their side hustle. <laughs> it's it's their cover. That's why the products are all bad. Mm-hmm. Because it's just a front for this detective agency. <laughs> <laughs> they don't expect anyone to order, so every time Wiley e. Coyote does, they have to scramble to throw something together. It's just some loose gunpowder and a shell, and that's why it always fails. <laughs> Do you know the story behind the name Acme? You've told me before. So I might have I might have mentioned it last time we covered this show, but the reason that Acme is used often in older things as a company name is because at one point when the phone book first came around, a lot of companies would name themselves Acme because it would get them put near the front of the phone book so they so when you looked up whatever you needed in the phone book the first companies you'd see were were called acme 
Because it was all alphabetical. God, it's like any time I look at the horror section at Barnes & Noble, and I, you just have to skip the K section, because it's just Stephen King. So if there's anybody else in the K section, I'm sorry, I can't find you. <laughs> well, the game is now over. However, there are still five minutes left in the episode. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... And and apparently this is a thing. In in some of the first ones that were filmed, the game didn't last long enough yet. And that's I I think that is the main reason that they added the order requirement. Because I think it does make that travel board round slightly longer. Well, it sounds like the lightning round is what would really pad out the episode a little bit. Yeah, probably that too, yeah. But uh, because there are five minutes left, they have to fill that extra time by having Rockapella perform the song that made them famous, Zombie Jamboree. It was a zombie jamboree that took place in the New York Cemetery. It was a zombie jamboree that took place in the New York Cemetery. Zombies from all parts of the island. Some of them were great Californians. Since the season was counted all, oh, they got together in Bacchanal. They were singing back, back to back, belly to belly. Well, I don't give a damn, cause I'm stone dead already. Back to back, belly to belly, a zombie jamboree. One female Didn't they perform that in the one that we watched already? They did, but in the one that we watched already, they seemed it seemed a more planned performance. It was, because it had clues in it this time. Yeah, it was. Whereas this time we're just getting the song performed normally. Right. It's a pretty good song. It is, but watching only those two episodes, I'm like, do they just end every episode with them singing Zombie Jamboree? No. <laughs> no, the first episode, the first aired episode, I assume they deliberately aired an episode that had a planned performance of Zombie Jamboree in it. Yeah, apparently they performed it on a, a Spike Lee TV special. Mm -hmm. And that was where they first made a name for themselves, basically. I can understand them wanting to open the show with an episode that included a performance of it. Sure. And then it seems like they just pulled it out whenever an episode was too short, they just pulled it out again. <laughs> Once Zombie Jamboree is done, they, they just kind of flow straight into a performance of the Carmen Sandiego theme. Well, she sneaks around the world from Vienna to Carolina. She's a finger filter from Berlin down to Belize. Taking you for a ride on a long bus to China. Tell me where in the world. Which continues over the credits. Yeah, the learning is done, but we're still trapped here. <laughs> I did enjoy the animations over the credits. Yeah. This is the most animation we see this episode. And we get to see a bunch of the goofy characters. Yeah, because we don't see that much of them in this episode, really. Mm -mm. But it's done. We did it. We did it. We beat Carmen San Diego's game show challenge. And Mike actually caught her. Good job, Mike Towner. But he let her go, apparently. She's still out there causing a few seasons worth of trouble. Well, I'm sure she... Someone broke her out, probably. I don't think the kid in the first one we watched caught her, though. I think he... I think she slipped away. I think she did, yeah. It was good. I liked it. I enjoy this show. I do enjoy this show, but I'm excited for us to get back to some of the later episodes where they've really kind of hit their stride. Yeah, I, we definitely need to see more episodes where things are more solid. Well, Mel. Yeah? Thank you for watching Carmen San Diego with me. You're welcome. Thank you for putting it in my eyeballs. Thank you, everyone, for listening to Mel watch Carmen San Diego with me. They didn't listen to me watch it. That would have been weird. You would have been weird. I'm always weird. I strive to be weird. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Did you catch Carmen San Diego? If not, 
why don't you leave us a comment and tell us why? <laughs> tell us how you aided and abetted her. Tell us exactly which questions you got wrong. We want your. We want to know. And then send an email to your history teacher about it. <laughs> Geography teacher. Whatever. <laughs> You're thinking of where in time is Sa Carmen San Diego, which we haven't watched yet. That's true, yeah. But we'll get to it someday. Some time? I <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> I hope the Rockapella still did the theme song. I don't actually know. I hope the Rockapellas are still living their best life. Oh, yeah. Oh, apparently they're huge in Japan. Good for them. We talked about this last time, but yeah, for some reason. Apparently, they found their biggest success in Japan. I, I don't know why, but I'm so happy for them. Mm -hmm. They are really good. I do enjoy them. Yeah. I give them shit for singing Zombie Zamboree. <laughs> 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 the, zombie Jamboree every episode, but it's still, it's still a bop. It is a bop. Well, if you'd like to support us to watch more Carmen San Diego and to buy new microphone for Mel, please head over to patreon.com slash super breakfast friends club where you can join our good friends Jamie Core and my mom oh uh, yeah in supporting us the two coolest people we know yeah coffee that's a place yeah there's coffee.com slash super breakfast friends club where things also happen I stream at skull pirate Mike on twitch you can find me at I, I'm skull pirate Mike at many places the skull pirate Mike that darkens the internet seas. Primarily, Twitch, Blue Sky, X. <laughs> Don't and call Etsy. it that. <laughs> Don't give him that. All right, Twitter. <laughs> Twitter. Twitter. Twitter goo. Twitter goo. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> you know, that's kind of full circle because we did mention Left 4 Dead earlier on in the recording. We sure did. <laughs> We're never not thinking about Left 4 Dead. Uh, it's true. I don't know why. Sometimes I just wake up and the air around me smells of Left 4 Dead. That was me. I'm sorry. <laughs>